Well, as Thanksgiving is just a few days away, everybody celebrates at a different time, depending on family, but many, many turkeys, thousands have given their lives already in sacrifice for that day of rest, right? And uh, I don't know how much rest it is because there's a lot of time and effort put into cooking everything, spending a lot of money, getting it on the table, making everything just perfect for that celebration together. And we all know that in America, Thanksgiving is based upon that first day that was observed by the pilgrims in 1621. We know after a long, hard winter, when many of them had not survived, they were thankful to God for the coming of spring and a chance to build a new life in what they considered their promised land. The new world offered them an opportunity but did not guarantee success. Many days of hard work and great struggles lay ahead. But those who were strong... Those who would not lose faith would make it through, and their faith in God was the major factor during those times. And faith in God has brought us to where we are today, and where we go from here will also be determined by our faith in God or our lack thereof. The observance of Thanksgiving Day as a national day of prayer and thanksgiving to God was established officially by President George Washington during his first term. So we come to this Thanksgiving with two world wars going on simultaneously. We've got Ukraine and Russia. We've got Israel and Hamas. And I want to take time in this message from Psalm 46 to use this psalm as a backdrop for praying for the Israelis and the innocent Palestinians that are trapped in Gaza because Hamas won't let them move out of the war zone after Israel has warned them. The facts, over 1,400 Israelis were killed by Hamas on October 7th. 2023. Over 200 hostages were taken that day, some of them Americans, into Gaza by Hamas. Now, Hamas is a Muslim terrorist group committed to the destruction of Israel. Their slogan is from the river, speaking of the Jordan River, to the sea. They want the Jews to no longer exist. I want to say that most Muslims are moderate or tolerant, but these are the extreme ones who take jihad literally and seriously. If you look at history, the Jews are not occupying a territory that was once populated exclusively by Palestinians. It was until 1947, a colony of Great Britain. It was pretty desolate land where few people lived. Many nomad shepherds, except for the few cities in the region, were found in the area. Because of the Holocaust, the United Nations, along with Great Britain, felt it was important for the Jews to have a place to live and call home so they could live in peace. The Balfour decision in 1917 at the end of World War I and the Holocaust led to this idea. And Great Britain left the colony and allowed Israel to create its own state in 1948. Israel left the West Bank and gave it to the Palestinian Christians and Muslims to create their own state and then also uh, supplied the area of Gaza for those Palestinians there as well. And they provide, today Israel does, the infrastructure for water, For electricity, the United States and Israel uh, give money financially to help the welfare people in that area, and Israel allows people to apply for visas to move out of Gaza to work and back in, back and forth. In Gaza, the unemployment rate is 55%. Some Palestinians view the Israelis as occupiers and do not recognize them as a country or state. Israel is made up mostly of Jewish people who are secular and are not practicing Jews. There has been a corruption found in the Israeli government, while there's been corruption among the Palestinian leaders in Gaza and the West Bank as well. And so Israel's response to Hamas on October 7th as attack is not proportionate or solely out of revenge, but is just, because they have a right, as any government or people do, to defend their homeland and their lives. And some of us are going to study a little bit more about the just war theory in our connect groups today, written by Augustine. So remember, God's covenant with Israel in Genesis to make them a people and give them their own land, and from Abraham would come many nations. We are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and those who bless Israel will be blessed. Psalm 122, 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Genesis 12, 3, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who... <clears throat> excuse me, who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
So as we turn to Psalm 46 and talk more about how to pray for Israel, we need to not only pray for the safety and protection of the Jewish people, but also the safety, protection, and prosperity for the innocent Palestinian Christians and Muslims who inhabit Gaza and the West Bank as well. So I hope you have your Bible open, your outline available, Psalm 46, some background. For good reason, Psalm 46 has been a cherished song across church history. This song of holy confidence has been deemed Martin Luther's song. It was the inspiration behind his timeless hymn called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was said of Martin Luther that in many times of trouble and danger, he would cheerfully exclaim, come, let us sing the 46th Psalm. He would go on to explain, we sing this psalm to the praise of God because God is with us and powerfully and, powerfully and miraculously preserves and defends his church and his word against all fanatical spirits, against the gates of hell, against the implacable hatred of the devil, and against all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and sin. End of quote. Almost two millennia later, the great pastor and key leader of civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr., would often employ Psalm 46 as a warning to unjust leaders that God would rise up and break the backbone of their oppression. Yet for our current generation of Christ followers, we can also draw upon these timeless truths of this psalm and apply them in prayer when we're facing turmoil, uncertainty, and tragedy like we see in the Middle East. We can apply these truths and principles to our own personal lives of trials, tribulation, persecutions, and uncertainty right here where we live. So our scripture reading today is from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. The writer of this psalm says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. Selah is a musical term for a pause. So may God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and let's bow for prayer together. Heavenly Father, I pray that these words that I share today would not be mine, but would be yours. We pray that you help the word of God to work in our hearts and lives. We thank you that it's a living word that can transform lives, that if we obey it, you promise us prosperity and success. And may we apply these principles from Psalm 46 to our lives personally. This week, we pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. First thing on your outline... We are to pause to pray and surrender to God who is our fortress. Pause to pray and surrender to God who is our fortress. We're going to look at three things today that we should pause and reflect on this Thanksgiving Sunday, and this is the first one. The theme of this psalm is God is our permanent place of refuge. That's the overarching theme of this psalm. This is in your emotional, mental, and physical aspects of your life. It's a spiritual perspective of seeing God as our ultimate protector and provider for our lives. We see this in verse 1, which is a good verse to memorize and hold on to on your spiritual journey. Another commentator says this psalm is about celebrating the presence of God. We're not sure of the occasion, if that were the case. It could be a celebration of victory over a battle, celebration of God's kingship at the autumn festival, Maybe the establishment of David's royal cult in Jerusalem. But God has prevented, presented in a very personal way to Israel. Look at verse 1. It says, God is with us. Verses 7, or God is for us. Verses 7 11, God is with us. And thirdly, God is awesome and grand. He's called the Lord of hosts or the Yahweh of hosts. Or Jehovah Sabbath, as in Luther's hymn, The Mighty Fortress is Our God. He's also called the God of Jacob. He's also the great king over all the world, but also the God of Jacob, showing his transcendence and his eminence. And we'll talk about that later. But we see a refuge, a refuge in times of trouble. Isn't it great? We have a God who provides a place of safety, a place that we can run to, a place that we can hide when everything around us is going wrong. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is with us and God is for us. He's the protector 
and he's the provider of our strength. So we see three metaphors, two of them here in the first verse and one in verse seven. We see refuge where one finds rest and a place of calm and turmoil. We see a great section of scripture in Psalm 91 that kind of describes that. It says in Psalm 91, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. God will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Our refuge, another metaphor he uses is strength. Strength, the ability to persevere during war or trying times in our life. In Psalm 29, 11, it says, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. In Psalm 68, 35, it says, awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. So we see these our refuge, he's our strength, but he's also a fortress in verse seven, we'll get to in a moment. Our fortress is an isolated place where people built a stronghold against the enemy. In Isaiah 33, 16, he will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given him, his water will be sure. In a wonderful proverb, it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. So we see a place of refuge, a place of strength and a fortress. And then we see a rock amid the storm, a foundation that we can place our feet upon, a rock. Look at verses two and three of Psalm 46. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. Verses two and three, we see Israel's confession of their God. And it's a comforting teaching to be reminded of continually. The Israelites will not fear because the world is gonna be judged. We see over and over in the Old Testament, the words, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, reminding the Jews that there's gonna be an ultimate judgment where God's gonna come down and wipe out the wickedness and balance all the books of justice. So the Lord's protection will be evident and is evidence to us today as the world is in significant political, cultural, and economic changes. Nations and kingdoms may cause great confusion and bring havoc on earth and they will all quickly fade away when God speaks his word of judgment. In Revelation eleven eighteen, it says, the, nation ra- the nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Israel will not only be preserved because they will believe in the Messiah Jesus during the tribulation period, but they are set to thrive in a special way during the thousand year reign of Christ in Jerusalem and on into the new heavens and the new earth. Romans gives us that promise. Romans 11 says, lest you be wise in your own sight, Gentiles, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in to the end of the church age. Verse 26, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Israel has a very, very bright future ahead. And we need to continue to pray, to pray for them. God's presence is evidenced through the psalm. And the first response it invites is verse two, a surrender to fear. The therefore in verse two charts a fearless path forward, even though utter chaos surround us. We see the descriptive words there of the mountains going into the sea and the, and the seas foaming up and all that. It's a period of great uncertainty and chaos and interruption. And we can pray along with our brothers 
and sisters in Israel and in Gaza for the presence of the Almighty to release them from the grip of fear and provide security at the heart level. You see, you and I, we can be personal people of refuge as well. Christian trauma expert, Dr. Jamie Otten, noted that when our friends and loved ones are impacted by violence and mass trauma, it can leave us feeling helpless, cause us to freeze up or say things we wouldn't normally say. Sometimes, we, he said, we speak harmless or harmful cliches. Dr. Atten claims that the best thing we can do is summed up in two words, offer refuge. He explains, some examples of how we can serve as a refuge include listening to people with acceptance, being present in your helping, and giving the gift of connection. He said he learned the importance of that idea of being a refuge from uh, studies that they performed with people that were survivors of Hurricane Katrina. And he noticed that there was a one survivor, he was trying to escape, he was driving his car along the coast and the rain and the winds were howling. He was losing visibility. He was about to give up. He didn't know what he was going to do. He was panicked and in fear. And he saw just a little bit off to his right in his peripheral vision, a neighbor holding a particle board sign. And it said, stop here. And he didn't know the neighbor, but he pulled in the driveway and found a haven of refuge there in the man's house through the storm. You and I, we can be personal people of refuge for others. May we reflect God's source of protection and strength as we talk with our loved ones and our friends during this Thanksgiving season and continue to pray for the innocent people in the midst of the crossfires of war. May we very well be someone's source of refuge and strength through conversations that we may have during this Thanksgiving season. Our application is this, how has God been a refuge and rock in your life in 2023? That might be something you want to share tonight when we gather for testimonies. How has God been a refuge and rock in your life in 2023? I encourage you to take some time and get alone and reflect and maybe even write down some of those things. The second thing we see in this psalm that should cause us to pause and reflect on is this, pause to trust God who is our fortress to sustain and secure us. To sustain and secure us. Look at verses four through seven of Psalm 46. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the most high God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. And God will help her when morning dawns, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. God continually helps us. God continually helps us. We see here something unique in Judaism and Christianity that our God makes himself accessible to himself for our protection. He makes himself accessible. The imagery here points to the hope of intimate and personal access to God's presence in our future. As we said, that when the Messiah returns to set up his thousand-year reign in Jerusalem, the city of God, it says here, when he establishes his throne in Zion and he remakes the new heaven and the new earth, we're going to find purity and rest in him. In verse 4, the city of God refers to Jerusalem, where we see it sometimes in the Old Testament as Zion. It says of the Most High in verse 4 parallels both the phraseology and the concepts surrounding the Garden of Eden. Eden is described as having a river that flowed out of it and was divided where there was a communion with God's presence, divided into four different rivers. The river shows God's blessing and provision for his people. It's a picture of God's blessing flowing through the nations during his millennial reign on earth. Mount Zion stands for the vision of God's kingship. Second, also similar to Eden, is the reestablishment of God's presence through the divine king in the most holy place, verse 5. That he will come and set up his throne. We read in Revelation of the new heaven or the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and God being on the throne here on earth. And Christ will dwell among the people of Israel, at which time a river will open up 
just below the altar and bring the gladness of life and healing to all along its course, making alive even the Dead Sea, according to uh, the book of Ezekiel in 43 and Isaiah 35. Third, when creation is renewed, it will be God's holy tabernacle where people will commune with the God of Jacob. And as God talked with Adam and Eve in the garden, as God talked to Moses on Mount Sinai, as he had a pillar of fire and a cloud by night, or a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night at the tabernacle to show his presence, as he talked to the prophets, as he sent Jesus, God incarnate in the flesh, and then as he sent the indwelling Holy Spirit to those who trust in Christ, and eventually his second coming, he will physically come back. We see God always, 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 always desires to be with his people. The people that he created, the people who love him and follow him. And God is continually with us. So we get to the Christmas season and we talk about that word Emmanuel means God with us. God is continually with us. We're assured by verse 5 that God always wants to protect and care for us. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 121. And contained in that psalm are these verses. God will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. What a great promise. We have a God that's always awake, always watching, always caring, protecting, looking out for our good. And so we think about that. God is with us. There's a story about Count Zizendorf, the founder of the Moravian Missionary Society in Europe. He came to faith in a Christ in an art gallery in Dusseldorf while contemplating a painting of Christ on the cross. And underneath it had this inscription, I did this for thee, what hast thou done for me? The picture had been painted by an artist 300 years before. And the story about that painting is this, that the artist was in his gallery and he was praying and he wanted to paint this painting of the crucified Christ, him on the cross. But he started with a sketch of the face of the Redeemer. And uh, he wasn't sure he quite got it. And so he brought the land the landlord's daughter in and say, honey, what do you see in this picture? And she said, I see a good man. Well, he tore up the sketch. He said he failed. He began to pray some more and he thought some more and he drew that sketch of a face again. And he asked the little girl to come back in and honey, what do you see? She said, I see someone who is greatly suffering. And he failed again, he said, and he tore up the sketch. And he prayed and meditated even longer, and he drew the sketch that eventually would be the face of Christ in this painting. And he brought the little girl in, and she said, that is our Lord, that is God. And so after meditation and prayer, he came up with the right person to put in that sketch. That alone makes the coming of Christ meaningful to the world. Not just a good man came, not just a wise man, not just someone who suffered, but the God of the universe, Emmanuel, came to be with us. The first of a twofold refrain serves as an exclamation point for the second stanza in verse 7. In Psalm 46, Lord of hosts speaks of God's transcendence, that he's beyond us, that we have a sense that somebody bigger than us is out there. But at the same time, he says, the God of Jacob showing you his eminence, his presence ever dwelling with us in time and history. We can pray for heavenly sustenance and security to interrupt and fill our earthly reality. This is especially true as we pray for God's presence and safety to become a reality in Israel and Palestine and in our nation and around the world. So as we approach Thanksgiving, the application here is how is God sustained and kept you secure in 2023. Can you look back and see how God has sustained you, giving you strength, kept you secure in this calendar year? 
Our last reflection from Psalm 46 should be this. Pause to behold and be still because God who is our fortress is among us. Pause to behold and be still because God who is our fortress is among us. Look at verse 8 of Psalm 46, 8 through 10. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted above the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We're to meditate, first of all, on the works of God. The works of God, verse 8, verse 9. Be wise and discerning. Consider the works of God. This includes all of God's acts of redemption leading to personal salvation, faith in Christ. Remembering the Lord's works plant deep in the mind and soul of the believer. The evidences of his care, protection, and sovereign rule stay with us. Wise people see the consistent work of God in the world and his people. The key is we have to be looking intentionally how God is working daily and then thank him for revealing himself through his works, big and small, that are all around us. Remember that all calamity points to the fact that one day the era of natural disasters and war will one day cease. God will usher in his kingdom of peace and justice. I heard a speaker this week say it this way, the world is not going to pieces but falling into place for Jesus' second coming. Take heart, it's a matter of our perspective. The God of peace will make the war cease, as it reminds us in Isaiah and Ezekiel and numerous prophets. And remember always that there's never, ever going to be lasting peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace returns and sets up his rule and reign on this planet. And we're to be glad in the world's distress because God is removing the wicked and ushering in his peace. And when the world is at peace and Jesus is on the throne, greater joy will eventually come to God's people. Second of all, meditate on who God is. Not on just his works, but meditate on who God is. So we come to verse 10 and finish the psalm in verse 11. In verse 10, it's such a well-known, often quoted, often memorized verse of scripture because of the peace and perspective it gives us. Through all the turmoil, the uncertainty, the despair, and sometimes endless tribulations, you and I, we stop and we reflect on the goodness of God and who he is in our lives. We're to be wise and discerning, as we said earlier, but the psalmist encourages the godly to know that the Lord is God. To God's people, it's a command to stop thriving or striving, stop striving and trust that the Lord of hosts will powerfully act on their behalf. It's a command of comfort of rest, an invitation to intimacy with the Almighty. For there's a certain quality of knowing God that can only be known through being still in his presence. But that whole phrase, be still and know that I am God, has a different perspective for God's enemies. It's a stern warning meant to awaken them from their illusion of control and halt their lust for power. In other words, the command to be still interrupts our tendency toward prayerless actions and reminds us that we can rest and trust in God's sovereignty. This command is followed by the prophetic pronouncement that sums up history's trajectory. God utters a double I will statement declaring that he will be exalted among all the nations of the earth. This certainly includes Israel, Palestine, Gaza, and all of the Middle East. Do we really believe this? If so, we can boldly pray this future reality into our current world and ask the Lord of hosts to interrupt the nations with a fresh recognition that he is God. In Psalm 20, verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Israel has been tempted over and over to find security in political alliances and military strength and even worldly paganism by following idols. Instead, they're encouraged to pursue godliness and holiness, all the while seeking God's refuge, strength, and fortress in a practical way. And how do we find refuge and strength personally? We do that by meditating 
and memorizing God's word and thinking about it throughout the day. We do that when we pray, bring our prayer requests to God. We have access to the very throne room of God through the name of Jesus because of the blood of Christ. And we can bring them to him. We can study God's word. We can journal what God is doing in our lives. That's how we find refuge and strength and God being a fortress in a practical way in our lives. The Christian life is in constant surrender to God's sovereign rule and his exaltation above all the nations. We're called in verses 8 through 10 to behold God, to be still in his presence, and trust his sovereign hand working in our lives despite the circumstances currently around us. And then the psalmist closes out his song by repeating the declaration he used in verse 7. Verse 11, it says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Our final application is this. How has God shown up in your life in big and small ways in 2023? How has God shown up in your life in big and small ways this current year? Remember at this Thanksgiving season, The key thought here, the overriding thought of this message is that God wants to display his sustaining power and protection in our lives to reveal himself and his glory. And he does that by working through us to be a refuge for others and other people's lives. So let us be available for God to do that as we encounter people in this week of Thanksgiving that maybe we haven't seen all year long or since the last holiday we've had together with them. And as we think about that, the greatest thing we can have that we can thank God for is our salvation, our salvation, the hope of eternal life. The Bible says that, as we read in our responsive reading, the Bible tells us that each and every one of us, we are sinners. We're separated from God because we've broken God's law. And it tells us in James, if we've broken the law at one point, we're guilty of breaking all the law. So all of us, all it takes is one lie to become a liar. All it takes is to steal a piece of chewing gum, you become a thief. We've broken God's law. But the good news at this Thanksgiving is that God sent Jesus to walk among us, to live a perfect life. But this goal pointed to dying on the cross and shedding his blood and being our substitute for our sin so that and trusting in him, not on anything we have done, but trusting on what he has done, we can have the free gift of eternal life when we come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to turn away from my sin. I want to turn to you. I accept your gift of dying on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins, and I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me my sins, and I want you to be my personal Savior. Maybe you're today, maybe you've never made that decision. It's the greatest thing you can be thankful for at this Thanksgiving season. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray. Maybe here today, as I said, and maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior. You're not sure that you have that eternal life. It's not based on works. It's not based on how many times I go to church or how much money I put in the offering plate or how many people I help in the community. It's based on trusting in what you did for us. And maybe you're here today and you say, I'm not sure that I know Christ. Pray this simple prayer and it's not the words that are magic, but it's the intent of your heart and just say, dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I stand before you guilty. But I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to cleanse me of my sin. Help me to turn away from my sin and turn to you and allow you to come into my heart and be my personal Savior and take charge of my life. I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I just encourage you to let someone know you came with that you prayed that prayer or be glad to see you out in the lobby to help you uh, if you prayed that prayer to begin a new spiritual journey this week.